Hey there folks, and welcome to our last major unit of the course, Vector Calculus. Here, we're gonna take all the ideas we know and love from calculus, like differentiation, integration, and the fundamental theorem of calculus, and we're gonna extend these to a different class of functions. You see, up until now, we've been focused almost exclusively on scalar fields. These are functions that might have multiple inputs, but spit out just a single output. So for example, f of x, y equals x plus y, that's a scalar field. Takes in two inputs, spits out one output. But now we're gonna be dealing with something a little different. We're gonna be dealing with vector fields. This is a fancy term for something with a very simple definition. A vector field is just a function from Rn to Rn. Notice that the dimensions here are the same. So a function from R2 to R2, that's a vector field. A function from R3 to R3, that's a vector field. These are the settings we're gonna be most interested in. In this lesson, we're just gonna be talking about the basics. We're gonna see some examples, learn how we can visualize vector fields, and learn about some physical interpretations. So let's start with vector fields on R2. At the moment, all we have to work with is our definition. A vector field on R2 would be a function f from R2 to R2. Okay, well, if it's going from R2 to R2, then it takes in two inputs, we'll say x and y, and it spits out, well, two outputs, which we could think of like a point or more commonly like a vector. So I'm gonna write this in vector notation. It's gonna spit out two components that will likely depend on x and y. So maybe in the first component, we have p of x, y, and in the second component, we have a function q of x, y. We could also write this in terms of our standard basis as p of x, y times i hat plus q of x, y times j hat. So what is this vector field really doing? Well, at every point x, y in its domain, it's giving us a vector, p of x, y, q of x, y, which means that if we go to our x, y plane, then at every point, we can plot this vector. We can plot a little vector given by our function that emanates from our point. And if we plot a whole bunch of these, we get a really pretty looking picture, something like this. You can see in this case, it appears that all the vectors are pointing us away from the origin. Maybe there's some particle there that's repelling everything else nearby, right? It's exhibiting some kind of a force pushing everything away. And so we might be able to interpret this as some sort of a force field. Let's try a concrete example together. Here, I'd like to sketch the vector field f of x, y equals y minus x. Now I have no idea what this thing looks like. And in general, visualizing a vector field from just its equation can be pretty challenging. So often what you're gonna have to do is pick a collection of points that's nicely distributed throughout your domain. You're gonna plug those points into your function to get the output vectors, and you're gonna plot a whole bunch of those vectors in your plane. That's gonna give you a good idea of what the overall field looks like. So for example, if I plug in the point one, zero, I'm gonna get y minus x for my output. That's gonna give me zero minus one. This means that if I start at the point one, zero, which might be here, then I should see the vector zero minus one. It points us downward. We can continue by moving to another point, let's say zero, one. At zero, one, we're gonna get the output vector one, zero. That points us to the right. And you can continue this. I'll let you verify that by plugging in these points, you're gonna get a table like this, and you're gonna get a vector field that looks something like this. Ah, quite pretty, huh? It almost looks like water moving through a whirlpool. Maybe that's what this is telling us. Maybe this vector field is telling us the velocity of water moving throughout a whirlpool. Or maybe it's telling us the velocity of air moving throughout a tornado. These are two possible interpretations. If you'd like a slightly nicer picture, here's one by Maple. Notice that Maple's vectors are a little bit smaller than my vectors. This is common. A computer will often shrink down the vectors in a vector field so as to not make the picture look too cluttered. But it does maintain the relative size of the vectors. So you can see the vectors are larger as we move away from the origin. The situation in R3 is similar, except of course we have a third variable and a third component function. Our vector fields in general are going to look like f of x, y, z equals p, q, r, which again, we can express in terms of the standard basis vectors. 
P times I hat plus Q times J hat plus R times K hat. So for example, let's see if we can sketch this vector field. Ooh, this looks pretty nasty. F of x, y, z equals minus x over the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared minus y over that same denominator minus z over that same denominator. Ooh, well, we could plug in points and plot the vector outputs just like on the last slide, but if you're clever, you might be able to avoid this. Notice that in this example, we have the same denominator in each component function the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. This quantity actually has some geometric significance. It's the norm of the vector x, y, z. So I could rewrite this entire vector as, well, I'm going to take out that minus. I could write it as minus x, y, z divided by the norm of x, y, z. Ah, but if we take a non-zero vector and divide by its norm, we're going to get a vector of length 1 right? So in my picture here, I'm going to see a whole bunch of vectors of length 1, and the question that remains is, in which directions are those vectors pointing? Well, I'm going to let you convince yourself that at the point x, y, z, the vector x, y, z is going to be pointing directly away from the origin. If you don't believe me, plot a few examples. So that means that this vector minus x, y, z is going to be pointing us directly toward the origin. So here we have a whole bunch of unit vectors pointing us right at the origin. It's going to look something like this. Now here's a picture generated by Maple that might be a little bit clearer. You can see that all the vectors are pointing us toward the origin. Everything's sort of being pulled in. So maybe you could think of this like a gravitational field. Maybe the Earth is centered at the origin and the arrows represent the force of gravity. Okay, now I know you've been waiting for me to say this for the entire video, so here it is. We've seen vector fields before. Back when we talked about gradient vectors, we also talked about gradient fields. And gradient fields are nothing but a special case of vector fields. As we'll see soon, a very special case. So as a quick reminder, if little f is a scalar field, so a function that we're used to working with from the first part of the course, then its gradient, its vector of partial derivatives, is a vector field. It takes in n inputs and spits out n outputs. It spits out an entire vector. So for example, if we take this function, f of x, y, z equals minus the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared, well, then we can compute its gradient vector by taking its partial derivatives. The derivative with respect to x will be minus x over the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. The derivative with respect to y is going to be similar, minus y over the square root of x squared plus y squared plus z squared. And again, we get something similar in the third component with respect to z. Sure enough, you can see that our gradient is going to take in three inputs and it's going to spit out a vector with three components, right? Three inputs, three outputs. Ah, this is exactly the vector field that we saw on the last slide. So that vector field actually arises as a gradient field. It comes from the gradient of a scalar field. If a vector field arises in this way, we give it a really special name. If capital F is a vector field that's equal to the gradient of some scalar field, we say that it is conservative. And as we'll see later, this term conservative relates to the law of conservation of energy. That's where it comes from. We also give a special name to the function whose gradient is equal to this vector field. We call this a potential function for F. And this comes from the term potential energy. So if we wanted to use our new terminology, we could say that this vector field is conservative and little f is a potential function for that vector field. Now it's worth noting that not all vector fields are going to be conservative. There are some vector fields out there that don't arise as the gradient of some scalar field. And actually, we've already seen one. As an exercise, try to show that our first example, f of x, y equals y minus x, is not conservative. It can't be written as the gradient of little f for some scalar field little f. As we'll see at the end of this week, conservative vector fields have some really, really nice properties. Okay, folks, there's your quick introduction to vector fields. The question is, what's next?
Well, now that we know the types of functions that we want to work with, it's time to start doing some calculus. We're going to learn how to take derivatives of vector fields in a couple meaningful ways by talking about curl and divergence. We're also going to learn how to take integrals of vector fields. This week, we're going to talk about line integrals, which tell us the amount of work one of these vector fields does in moving a particle along a given path. In a couple weeks, we'll also talk about surface integrals, which will allow us to measure the rate of fluid flow over a surface. Now, back in Calc 1, you learned about a deep connection between the world of derivatives and the world of integrals, called the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus. In Vector Calc, there's also a deep connection between these worlds, given by three amazing theorems. Green's Theorem, Stokes' Theorem, and the Divergence Theorem. We're going to be covering them all in Math 207.